Hey everybody. Hello, 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 my blind tasters, my wine nerds, my psalms in training, my um, onophiles, my weirdos, you know, whoever else is out there. I'm so happy that y'all are tuned in. Um, I promise you that you do not have to actually be blindfolded to participate in this video. Um, that was a, a weird idea that I had um, for that picture and um, starting to regret it now because I think everyone's going to think blind tasting actually means you have to be blindfolded and that's not. So um, if you're tuned in, couple things that I need to make sure that everyone's on board with. Um, hey, Jen. Hey, Jared. Awesome. Dante and Robin here too. Awesome. Cheers to you on Virginia Beach. That's fabulous. Um, if you're can participate in the chat room. This is going to be really difficult um, for me if I can't see the chat room and if I can't see your comments. So if you are tuned in, just comment who you are, where you're coming from, um, and uh, so I can know um, who my audience is. Obviously, the people who ordered wine know y'all are tuned in, but I know there's a bunch of other people out there. So hey, Marion and Tom from Williamsburg, Tawana, hello, hello. Tawana, this is your, and Marion and Jen, I think this is all your second blind tasting class, maybe third, I'm not sure. Um, Steve and Trina Hill, I happen to know that that is in fact true because they are across the table from me. So I will tell everyone that you said hello to Sam Mom um, who delivered all of your wine this week. So thank you to her. Um, Michelle, Courtney and Andrea here from Williamsburg. Awesome. Literally was just there this afternoon delivering your wine. Um, Taryn and Don from Colorado, by the way, if you have other friends from other states who want to participate in the blind tasting classes or any of the virtual classes, mm -hmm. I am happy to call their local wine store and set up um, a pack of similar wines. They might not be the same wines because they might not be available in all states. They'll be similar enough so that people from other states can participate. I did that yesterday for a private event with um, family members from Hawaii, Connecticut, Massachusetts, and uh, Florida. So. Loads of fun if you want to do that. And so tell all your friends that I'm happy to do that as well, coordinate with local wine stores. So um, uh, third for you, Tawana. All right, so you could just like start teaching these classes by now, I think. So um, awesome. Lisa, hi from Carrollton. Awesome, just down the road from where I am now. Um, from Colorado, awesome. So Kelly, hopefully um, the wines are gonna be amazing. I know this is your first time tuning in and picking out the wines, um, picking up the wines from the store in Colorado. Um, Justin and Jonathan are the two wine store reps that I've worked with there and they've been amazing dealing with all my crazy questions, uh, setting that up. So definitely give them a shout out. Um, Kevin Carey from Chesapeake there, great to see you. Some of the best food I've ever had has come from Kevin, so thank you guys so much. Um, Luke, this is your first time tuning in, I think, so welcome, welcome. Um, and uh, <laughs> awesome, oh yeah, so fabulous. So in the DC area, I work with wine stores there all the time, so definitely let me know, anybody who wants to tune in. So, so we have a smaller group of people tuned in for this night's um, wine class, just because it's Mother's Day weekend, a lot of people had travel or other plans, um, but that is going to mean it's gonna be a lot more like individually participatory. So I can only say that word at the beginning of the wine class, definitely not at the end, I will stumble over that. But um, participation is key. So when I ask a question, I need you actually involved in the chat room. If this is playing like on a smart TV or something like that, then if you have a phone or an iPad or some sort of tablet or something like that, that it could also be playing on mute that you could easily type your um, questions and answers to. That would be incredible just so I can be involved a little bit more with your personal experience with these wines. So, hey, Jimmy and Dorothy. Hey, Vince, also brand new. Uh, Vince and Tina here. So Lauren and Becky, fabulous in large map. Am I correct? Is this first time for y'all? Um, and if so, how again did y'all hear about this? I'm, I'm curious. So love that the word of these classes is spreading. I love what I do. Wine education is my jam. Um, and I am just happy to be able to do it virtually with technology, even if I can't do it live in person anymore for the time being. Hopefully, hopefully life resumes uh, pretty shortly, but we'll see. All right, so setup here. So awesome. 
First time from the McMahons. Awesome. So Christine McMahon, who I've met, um, I think she should be tuned in too. Um, I did a private event through them. Stay tuned, y'all. So I'm going to start promoting these private events through Zoom if you want to connect with family members and friends from all over and just do like a private wine event. So um, stay tuned for that. I will uh, start um, giving details about how those packages work. So, all right, how tonight is going to work. First of all, we're going to have fun. We're going to learn something. We're going to have fun while we do it. That's the point of wine, right? Wine is supposed to bring enjoyment to our lives. So this is not going to be any fun if, if we're going to be too analytical and intense about it. That's part of the reason why it's difficult for me to just sit down and enjoy a glass of wine. I struggle with that sometimes because my brain is too involved and I start breaking down and analyzing the wine a little too much. Um, and and that's and that's that unfortunately takes some of the joy that wine brings to your life out of the picture. So that is not what I'm trying to do. We are definitely going to be analyzing wine and treating it a little bit more on an intellectual cerebral level, but it should still be fun. So please, if you're nervous or intimidated or a little bit like trepidatious going into this, um, don't be. We're going to have fun. We're going to have a blast and uh, we'll learn something, one thing maybe along the way. So if you have, these are your wine tasting sheets. We're going to start with the white wines, obviously. You can go ahead and pour them. So you have two glasses in front of you at the same time. Hopefully you got the email with the instructions. Each person in your tasting group is going to have two glasses at once. So there's my wine. That's an important thing to have uh, in a wine tasting. So white wine, number one is going to be the glass on your left. So that's what the tag says. White wine number one is the one with the true cork on it. Hopefully nobody looked at corks or screw caps too, uh, too intensely while uh, you opened uh, the wine. We don't want to cheat or give away anything uh, when we're drinking. So white wine number one, glass on the left. So just like we read left to right, we're going to taste left to right. White wine number two that has the screw cap is going to be glass on the right. Just in case I mixed anybody's tags up on their bottle. You know, wine number two on the right has the screw cap. Wine number one has the true cork. So left and right, keep them in line. Because normally in a class, if people mix up their glasses, I can go and smell your glass and figure out which one is which and put them in the right order. For that, unfortunately. Um, so make sure you keep them left and right at all times is how we're going to be doing it. So your tasting sheets are set up the same way. So left, wine number one, right, wine number two. On the opposite side, you have the uh, the red wine sheets, if everyone notices. It's printed on cardstock and uh, in blue ink. Not because I'm fancy, um, because I ran out and Amazon deliveries are all delayed right now, so I haven't gotten my new stuff in. So um, enjoy the cardstock, and I'm sorry that the blue ink is maybe harder to read. Um, Next sheet that you have that we'll be using throughout both of these wines are the basics of tasting. And then on the reverse side, the wine aroma chart. So if you're from far away and you're printing these out, definitely make sure you have those on hand. This, however, please hide this away. Don't look at it. Don't start reading it because it will trick your brain and just start making conclusions way too early in the game. So this classic descriptors, Hide that away. We're only going to use that when it comes to the actual conclusion part. So white wines poured real quick. I just want to talk about why blind tasting exists. Why does this skill set need to exist in the world? And basically it's this. Wine professionals, whether you're a sommelier in a restaurant, a winemaker themselves, or a, um, a wine rater, we need to analyze wine without the confirmation bias that tells us what we should expect to see and smell and taste in the wine. So it's basically like if you go into a movie, having never seen a preview, having never heard a recommendation from any of your friends or anyone else about it, and you just go in with this blank slate, you have no preconceived notions about the movie. So your, your analysis throughout the movie and at the end of the movie will be a little bit more objective 
because you weren't going in with preconceived and um, does the murderer get caught? Um, you don't have these notions. And so you can go in there with just like wide open, um, um, blank slate, able to write anything on it. And so in order to taste wines truly objectively, um, obviously individually, because we all have different, unique individual palettes, but in order to taste them objectively, we need to cancel out all of the other information that is being told to us every other time we drink wine. It's recommended to us by the wine store. Kira told us it's delicious. Um, your friend said it's their favorite wine. Um, your mom buys a case of it at a time. <clears throat> all of those things um, tell us information about wine and lead us to different conclusions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, sorry. I promise it's not Corona. It's just <clears throat> allergies and maybe um, the chips with guacamole that I had before this. Um, <clears throat> so breaking that all aside, we are just going to analyze wine. So the point is not to guess the right wine. That's the fun part, the challenging part, the skill we get to learn. But the actual point is just to analyze the wine without preconceived notions. And so that's what makes it so fun um, without that pressure of, am I going to guess it right? Am I going to get the right answer? No, the, the, the right answer is the right analysis of the wine. It doesn't really matter if you get the right grape or not. So don't worry. It's going to be a lot of fun. And it's just a skill that you can learn if you practice enough. So we're going to be practicing um, tonight. All right. So everyone have your white wine sheets ready. Um, Christine, hi, Christine and Pat. Um, <clears throat> awesome. So a wine marker to mark your glasses. That's helpful. If you have that, um, I did that with my decanters and I used a Sharpie. So I thought, oh, I'll just be able to rub that off. Nope. All my decanters. Now I have a bunch of them now have one through eight marked on them for all time. So be careful with Sharpies on crystal. Um, Brian from Norfolk, awesome, with uh, uh, Henry, Maggie, and Dorothy, fabulous. Um, great to see everybody. Amanda and Matt watching too, fabulous. Um, um, all right, great. So first things first, why do we taste side by side? Big reason, hopefully, this is my left, hopefully it's mirror in the left. Okay, yeah. no, okay. No, it's on the right. It's on the right, okay. Well, it's her left hand. Right, okay. Her left. So I didn't know if it was me or image or not. Um, this is my left. So when I hold this up, don't get confused. Um, why we taste side by side is because it offers the most comparison. It's really hard to analyze a wine by itself with no comparison at all. So that's why we're going to do two sets of two wines side by side. Um, let's get in. Y'all ready for this? <laughs> yes, I'm so excited. Um, all right, y'all are like, let's just taste the wine, Kira. Um, okay, so wine on the left, wine on the right. Hold them in those hands, and let's first analyze sight. So the most important part um, is to go in order when you're blind tasting wine. So if you skip ahead to smelling or tasting right away, your brain is not giving. So let's start with sight. So on this... Um, Blind, uh, a wine 101 basics of tasting. We're just gonna go through all of those steps. So the first step is clarity. Is the wine hazy or cloudy at all? So if you hold both wine glasses up, I like to hold them further down along the stem because it's easier to swirl that way. And man, I'm getting good at this with all this like having to do it on camera. Not very good, but much better than I was. I couldn't do this without spilling the wine before swirling two wines. Um, so we're swirling with the light source in the background and we're seeing how clearly the wine is reflected through, I mean, the light is reflected through the wine. Is there cloudiness, haziness? Is there apparent sediment or bubbles in the bottle? Um, I see um, no, outside of just some condensation in the glass, I see no um, cloudiness or haziness. I do see bits of sediment. Um, do y'all see bits of sediment? Um, tiny, tiny little bits um, in both of these um, glasses. This is why polishing your glassware is so important in uh, blind tasting. If you don't polish that glassware, you could just have dust in the glass and that's gonna lead you to believe there's sediment, which changes your idea of the wine. Um, so I see both of these glasses were polished. 
but I do see tiny bits of sediment, just particles kind of hanging out. It almost looks like just dissolved carbon dioxide uh, in the wine. So this wine might be pretty young is what that tells us. So, all right, so Tawana says um, some minor sediment, but otherwise clear, yes, no uh, uh, cloudiness or haziness at all. Um, next is color. Most people will just hold the wine up to the light to see color. Well, unfortunately, this just picks up color from all around the room. To really see color better, we are going to actually hold it on its side with a white background just about an inch or so, an inch or two behind it. So if I hold um, wine number two up, it looks a lot darker than it does when I hold it just straight down and look down through it. So for white wine, basically the three colors, the three color categories would be straw, yellow, or gold. Um, and then you always have like these secondary colors or flex. Um, when you get to wine blind tasting 202, I'll definitely make you get into that. But um, if you notice the wine on the left definitely has more like green and yellow flex to it, almost some silvery blue hues too. Versus the wine on the right is definitely more of that um, dullish yellow flex to it. So definitely not as brilliant, not as, um, yeah, quite different in color, even though the concentration is the same. So neither of these wines is super concentrated. You can easily read through it. Um, it actually helps you read, acts as a magnifying glass. Um, and um, But you definitely have a little bit more of those greenish hues to the first one, so it's much paler. Um, and the second one, while still pale, has a little bit more of those yellowish hues to it. So second reason we swirl. So first, to see the clarity. Second is to see the um, legs of the wine. So the legs, after you swirl the wine, give it some good swirls, um, extra wine uh, forms these teardrops or drips or drops or legs or whatever you wanna call them and they fall down the inside of the glass. So you kind of have to wait for, you have to, have to swirl aggressively first, especially with it's the first wines in your glasses. Um, and then look at the part of the glass that's further away from you. It's easier for your eyes to focus on the legs that way with the light source behind you still. Um, and you're looking at how thick they are. Um, so how much time those legs spent in the gym, how much weights are they lifting, um, versus how thin they are and harder to find. Usually, the thicker the legs, the easier they are to see, the more defined they are, the slower they will form and fall. And that's an indication of higher alcohol content. So alcohol just increases viscosity. And especially when you get to like blind tasting 202 and 302 kind of thing, um, um, alcohol tells us a lot about what vintage it might be, um, what year is harvested, um, or where it comes from. So um, the legs are pretty darn important. I know we all love looking at legs and talking about them, but that is why we look at them. So wine number one, I see um, um, they are still defined and are still forming, even though the wine has kind of slowed down. So um, that's actually surprising to me for white wine to have this much definition in the legs on wine number one. Let's check out wine number two. Um, thicker, but also less defined. And probably slower to form and fall, I would say, on, on wine number two. I'm gonna walk y'all through the first steps of this. And then once it gets to like the smelling and the tasting, it's gonna be a lot more of, I'm going to ask you what you get out of the wine. But for the first steps, I'll walk you through this so we can kind of have a baseline. Um, so number one, super thick legs. Number two seems slower. Yes, okay, fabulous, wonderful. Glad, um, glad we're, we're getting through this. And yes, easily see through both, some minor sediment. So kind of nail down some sites. We've already got a lot of information about the wine. One of the other reasons why I think it is so important to, um, to really go through the site of wine first is because that allows the wine a little bit of time to warm up in the glass. So with white wine, if you just pull a white wine out of the refrigerator that's 37 to 40 degrees, that's pretty darn cold and you don't get any of the aromatics of the wine because it's too cold to release them. The aromatics of a wine are released 
when alcohol evaporates. Um, just does so in a very small way, um, but as, as it coats inside the glass and interacts with oxygen, um, a little bit of a warmer atmosphere around it, allows for that alcohol to evaporate in just tiny amounts and releases those aromatic compounds called esters. So that's why I take enough time also to really aggressively swirl, let the wine open up, as we say. Um, so um, let's get our noses in there. So that's the third reason why we swirl is to allow those aromatic profiles to be released. So what I like to do when I'm blind tasting, especially two side by side is swirl both and just go back and forth a couple of times to get an initial impression of, of the wines. Don't make conclusions. Don't think about what you're smelling. Just make an initial impression. Just, um, I'm gonna give you guys, before you even start trying to name anything that you're smelling, I'm gonna give you guys like 15 seconds to just smell your wine. Hmm. All right. I think that was the first time I was successful in actually giving you time. <laughs> I'm really bad at um, giving that time to do the thing that I just said I was gonna give you time to do because it means being silent on camera, which is super awkward and weird. So it's been my, um, my number one um, uh, recommendation for my friends is that I need to, 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 to let y'all have some time to uh, breathe uh, for a bit. So um, I'm working on that. Um, all right, so now we're gonna start analyzing this smell. Now that we've got kind of the first impressions. Um, first of all, I go over the intensity of the wine. So how intense is the wine? Is it jumping out of the glass, like smack you across your face? This is who I am. Or is it, I, I don't smell anything. Where Where is this wine? Or somewhere in between. So on a level of one to five, let's say um, how intense is each of the wines? On, go ahead and mark wine one and two. And if you're going to um, put it in the comment section, which I would love to see, just put two intense or one uh, moderate or something like that, whatever scale you want to do. So um, we know which wine you're talking about. So um, let's talk about, all right, so number one, not jumping. Number two is jumping. All right, anyone else agree, disagree? All right, so Taryn, who is in Colorado, has different wines. Um, and I can't wait to talk about these wines after after they get released or after they get the details get released. Um, number one has some funk to it, and the other two smells cleaner and um, sweet, sweeter almost. Okay, interesting. All right, so we also see number one seems more intense than number two. Okay, so we've got someone says the reverse. Interesting. Um, anyone else has, has an idea of which one is more intense, which one is more expressive, which one is jumping out of the glass a little bit more? I honestly find um, both of these to be super similar. Um in terms of intensity, not in terms of what I'm smelling, but intensity. So if you're really prone to picking up one smell or the other, then one wine might seem like way more intense, but I think the overall intensity is relatively similar um, between both of these. So next thing, we are going to use this wine aroma chart. So this is basically like a vocabulary word bank to get to know some of the wine descriptor words that are used when we're smelling a wine and trying to name that smell. So go through some of these and basically it's just there to while you're smelling and you're like, I think I smell something, but I'm not sure what it is. I, I, it's on the tip of my tongue. Going through some of these words kind of helps jog your memory. I'm um, trying to remember the password and he jogs his memory too hard. Basically, that's what I think of every time I uh, say jog your memory. So um, a little bit of a nerd fact there. Um, so go through these and if you get any specific aromatic, whether it's fruit or non-fruit, go ahead and put it in the comment section. What are you smelling out of these wines? So um, Mint says, um, 
Some wet gravel. Okay, cool. Um, Vince, which wine are you talking about for that wet gravel? Is it wine number one or wine number two? Tell us. Um, Luke says, um, number one is smoother and number two is sharper. Interesting. Okay, so we've got a textural component to um, the smell or are you tasting yet? Um, um, Luke, uh, would you clarify that? Um, um, Dorothy says, soft clover, melon, and buttery nose on wine number one. Okay, interesting. Um, um, Brian, number two, a little fl flutterly, sorry, number one, um, uh, floral, is that, sorry, um, it's also, I'm far away from my computer and I have terrible eyes, so it's hard to see, okay, so Vin says you were talking about number two for the wet gravel, interesting, okay, I think there's definitely some minerality on both of these wines, um, number, number two, the like minerality that I get is definitely a little bit more of like, um, almost like clayish, like wet clay. Number one, I get a little bit more like the, that wet sidewalk thing, but definitely minerality on both of those. So nose on number one, not crazy about, but loves the palate. All right, we're just starting nose first. Let's just clarify, we're just getting into nose first. We gotta take it step by step. Um, um, number two, you like the nose, okay. So malady and even chlorine, interesting on number one. Um, huh. I almost smell like saltiness, and they have a saltwater pool. So I wonder if like the brain is making the connection between the saltiness and the chlorine because of the pool. I don't know. Interesting. What do you think? It's not strong, so it could be just mineral. Okay. So um, I don't know. Okay. Just a little bit. All right. Um, all right, so Kay says number two is chalky, number one, some green watermelon, Ryan. Okay, love this. We talked about melon before, and now we're getting a little bit more specific. Fabulous. Green apple on number two, super interesting. Um, and y'all are in Colorado, so I know which wine y'all are tasting out there. Um, number one is smooth. Okay, so clarifying that it is the textural component of the aromatics that are smooth on number one. Um, and number two, sharp as in fruity and springy. Okay, interesting, awesome. So the most important part when you're smelling um, is not actually to name the fruit or herbs or flowers itself, but it's generally to, um, to name the condition that tells us more information about the specifics of the wine. So is it underripe? green watermelon rind or green melon rind or is it super ripe if you're getting lemon is it is it like lemonade like sweet and juicy meyer lemon or is it like super tart and acidic um, um or is it baked pears or fresh pears um so the fruit condition just what condition is the fruit that you're smelling is really important so on wine number one i am getting man it's just hard, kind of hard to get past the citrus and the minerality um, of this wine, but it's definitely like underripe, fresh citrus. It's not baked. It's not dried. It's not jammy. It's not stewed. Um, it's definitely like bright, fresh, crisp citrus fruit, grapefruit, tangerine, clementine, and lemon, a little bit of lime, maybe like all of the citrus basically, but on that underripe, more bitter side, um, and loads of that minerality. Number two, much weightier in texture um, um, on the nose. I'm getting a little bit more of the baked quality of, of the fruit on number two in terms of condition. So we've got like underripe and tart on wine number one. A little bit more of this baked round, almost got some like cinnamon and clove kind of um, aromatic to wine number two. A little bit of this like almost like buttery, like something I'd, I'd bake, like a, a, a baked tart um, that has, you know, butter melting on top of like the crust in the oven. Um, I don't bake by the way, but other people do and I've smelt it before. <laughs> um, so um, definitely condition is totally different on these, even if the intensity I think is pretty similar on both of them. So, all right, any other non-fruit? We talked about gravel. Um, we talked about some minerality. Um, we talked about sidewalk versus clay. Um, any other things that you're smelling? Floral notes in the wine. Um, 
herb notes, um, either fresh or dried. Um, leather, spice, I talked about some like cinnamon and kind of clove component to this one. Um, we talked about chlorine, that's a non-fruit thing. Anything else yet that you're smelling um, that is not fruit related? Brian says, thumbs up on baked quality, yes. Okay, so. All right. Um, Taryn says some flowers on our number one. Okay, yes, yes, yes. Um, and then the plastic petrol scent on number two. Okay, interesting. Sorry, I'm trying to like keep all the different wines that everyone's uh, tasting in my mind. Um, all right, now I know everyone's super ready. Hopefully you pre-gamed, um, so we're not just like chugging these wines when we get to it. Um, when you taste wine, I always like to get the first impression of the taste, just like we did for the nose. So just take a small <laughs> sip of one. Kind of swallow it right away. Don't think too much about it. Just let you have, let your brain have a first impression. Then wait a couple seconds and do that to wine number two. And then we're going to get into the analytics. So wine number one. Cheers, everybody. Two blind tasting. All right, my first impressions are um, pretty darn great. So not that that is important when you're blind tasting at all. I just find it hard to um, remove the expressions from my face. So it was, it was obvious enough to just say out loud. All right, so now let's get into analyzing the wine. Um, so first, let's talk about acid. So acid is the mouth watering effect in the back of your mouth, um, right where your salivary glands are, right where your jaw meets. So take a larger sip in your mouth than you might be used to um, doing with wine, because it's like dainty and delicate. No, we're not going to be dainty and delicate here at all. Um, and take a larger sip, swish it around your mouth, kind of like mouthwash, let it coat every part of your cheeks, your gums, your roof of your mouth, your tongue, everything. After you swallow the wine, you have to swallow the wine first to do this. You're gonna lean back and touch the tip of your tongue to the roof of your mouth right behind your front teeth and breathe in. So swish and swirl and then swallow and then suck in that air so all the airflow gets concentrated right where your salivary glands are. Focus your feeling on the effects of your salivary glands right here. How much are you puckering up? Um, like you just did, uh, like uh, you just sucked on a raw lemon, um, or is there no effect at all? Then you can lean forward and you can feel the mouth watering effect, the drool effect. So if you lean forward after doing that and you like immediately need a napkin because you're about to drool all over the place, the wine's got some high acid. So do that on one, give yourself a pause, drink some water in between one and two to kind of like neutralize uh, the pH balance of your mouth. And then do the same exact thing on wine number two. And let's see what we think the acid levels are. One to five, one being low, five being crazy high. Oh yeah. Yep. <laughs> that's uh that's got some high acid for sure. Sorry, did I just um did I just ruin something by saying mm. that? Mm, my mouth is still watering. He likes it when I'm wrong. Some mom and some dad are over here fighting about acid levels in the wine. I love it. Um, cool. All right. Man. All right. This is just like, I, I am having confirmation bias here. First of all, because I know what wines I'm drinking. Second of all, because I know I like both of these wines. So every sip, I just get more and more excited because they're just so delicious. Um, all right, so let's talk about acid level. Um, holy acid, Batman. Yes, absolutely. Um, both of these wines actually have 
Number two smelled so rich and weighty and baked. You thought it was going to be like soft on the palate, like a warm hug. No, it was not. That was a um, that was a, that was a snack of acid right there. Um, so lots of acid. Definitely aesthetic number one. Thumbs down on drooling. Um, I'm glad you didn't drool, Oliver. I try not to drool on camera, although it has definitely happened on live uh, YouTube before. I'm sure. Um, yes, acid, 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 both acidic. So one has two, like level two acid. Oh my gosh, there's so many numbers. I'm struggling to read that. Two has three and a half. Um, so because these are our first wines, we're comparing them against each other, but we haven't tasted wines before this. We don't have a benchmark for what level two acid is or what level three and a half or what level five is. I would say just benchmark style. Yes, I'm actually getting a little bit higher acid on the second one. So I'd agree with the level of difference, but I'd say level um, number, the wine on the left, wine number one is more like a level three and a half. And, and we've got more like a level four um, possibly on um, wine number two. So I do agree wine number two has a little bit more acid, but both of these are pretty, pretty acidic. Um, so um, number two, okay, seems lower acidic um, on the high end. Okay, so yes, I have some crazy faces. Yes, we were just talking about that earlier. It's impossible to have a, a thumbnail randomly made throughout a video because everyone is um, some crazy face I'm making. Um, so um, <laughs> yes, okay. So fabulous. So Luke says uh, wine number one is more like a three and wine number two is like a four. Great. So we, I think so far people are agreeing that wine number two has slightly higher acid than wine number one, but both of them have some acid to them. They've got some structure. They've got some refreshing zippiness to it. So um, while the second wine is richer and weightier, it still has higher acid. So that's what blind tasting is all about. It's not taking the whole of a wine. It's breaking down each different component. So I'm not just thinking the overall thickness, tannin, alcohol, body, all of these things, and that's going to give us information. So force your brain to focus just on one small aspect of each of the structure components of the wine that we're going to go through. So we just went through acid. Let's talk about uh, let's talk about sweetness level. Um, so. Sweetness level, you want to concentrate your focus and the wine experience just on the tip of your tongue because that's where the highest receptors uh, for like sweetness are on your palate. So just stick the tip of your tongue into the glass like so. That's it. Super awkward to do in public. Way more awkward to do on live camera for the internet to see. Um, so y'all feel free to do it at home um, with no judgment. Um, again, you want to neutralize your palate before you do it to the second one. With all this water in between each of the wines, you should be very hydrated at the very end, at the end of this tasting. Um, wine number one, I have no sweetness at all. I did not feel any sugar residue on the tip of my tongue at all. Let's try it for wine number two and do it for both of them. You tell me if you get any sweetness on wine number two. Don't put the wine into your mouth because, again, that changes your focus um, of the experience away from just the sweetness. What do you think? Number two is pretty sassy. Okay, yes. I think I was talking about the acid, but tell me about sweetness. Do we get any sweetness on the tip of our tongue for wine number two? No sweetness on either, Jen says. Both dry. Okay, great. Anybody else want to disagree? A little more on two. So slight yeah, sweetness. So number one was close to bone dry. It almost felt chalky on the tip of your tongue because it was so dry. Number two did not have that same chalky effect of the wine on the tongue. Let's try it again. Yeah, I mean, I, I just feel like I put my tongue into lemon juice and chalk. Um, number two. There might be like 
three whole grams of residual sugar um, per liter on that wine. So I would agree with some mom, um, some mom for the win. Um, that the second one, okay, awesome. So um, Luke would agree with you too. So there you go, you have, a, you have an agreement. So no sweetness on number one, a little on two. Kelly agrees with you. Um, Taryn agrees with you. All right, fabulous. So um, again, both of these wines are definitely considered dry. So you're not off by saying that these are dry wines. They're definitely both considered dry wines. Um, one just might have like literally one gram of sugar in the entire, I mean, number two um, might have just like literally one to two grams of residual sugar in the entire bottle. So definitely still a dry wine, but tiny amounts there. Um, all right, so we've done acid and sweetness. Tannin, we're gonna skip that. That's really just with the red wines. Alcohol level is really just how far down your throat do you feel um, that alcohol pop, that alcohol burn, that alcohol evaporation? So the further down you feel it in your throat, the higher the alcohol content. So if you take a shot of tequila, um, I love tequila, so I know this, um, you feel that burn all the way down um, versus, you know, Coors Light, you don't feel it at all. So wine is pretty much from 11% to 15%. So if you feel it up to here, it's lower alcohol content. If you feel it down to here, higher alcohol content. And each kind of like half a knuckle would be like a percentage point. Um, it's literally, it's it's this it's this deductive, right? These are just like a skill set. You just break down this chart, and then and then you you analyze the wine this way. So um, try it on both. You do. Um, I've been studying my wine, but I do have to swallow the wine for this uh, for for this test. Um, at all, and so the first wine is always so delicious. Mmm, interesting. Um, okay, what do y'all think here for the um? So both of these seem on the lower end. I would I would definitely agree with that, Tawana. Um, neither of these are like crazy high alcohol content. I do think, and I actually, I don't know the alcohol percentage of these wines, so I am blinding this. Um, I do think that one of them has slightly higher alcohol percentage. Which one is that? You tell me. Taryn, who's tasting again, different wine in Colorado. Um, she says number two has slightly higher. Some mm -hmm. mom says two is slightly higher. Um, do you present that nickname, Samma? I just realized I never asked you permission to call you Samma. I just, um, after a couple glasses of wine, came up with that name and thought it was brilliant and stuck. So, all right. So, Samma says too, and she doesn't resent the nickname. That's good. Um, two. On, right, so, you're saying level two alcohol on both. Um, Jen Long, are you saying it's level two or two is higher? Tawana says two might be slightly higher. Number two. Okay. So I think we're all saying the same thing. Wine number two, slightly higher alcohol content. I felt that burn closer to here versus the first one, probably like a whole percentage point lower in alcohol, higher up on the esophagus. Sort of like when people say, turn the AC down. What do you mean, the temperature down or do you wanna turn the fans down so the effects are lower? Like which one is it? So when I say higher alcohol content, but lower on the, yeah, it's, it's that very confusing uh, thing, up or down. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, but not by much. Yes. These are pretty similar. Let's talk about body. This is going to be key to determining the difference between both of these wines. So body is kind of the weight of the wine on your tongue. So after you swallow the wine, concentrate on just like how heavy the wine feels like it's sitting on your tongue, not how long the finish is, not how high the alcohol is, not the sweetness, not the acid, not anything else, just the weight of the wine on your tongue. Is it like skim milk where it just weighs nothing or is it like whole milk where it kind of like weighs you down with it? So do one, take some water, balance out your mouth, do two, and then let's see which one has a fuller body to it. Water, sorry. Mm. 
Hmm. All right. Yes, Vince, you're right. Um, no one believes me when I'm in a private event, like I'm going over to people's houses doing these wine classes. No one believes me that that's a real test that sommeliers do in the tip of your tongue. Um, they're always like, no, we're on candid camera, right? Like that's not a real thing. So um, yes, when you start doing this around other people, they're gonna laugh at you for sure. Just tell them you're taking private lessons from a sommelier. Um, all right, let's talk about um, fuller body. Number one seems fuller body than number two, Tawana says. Um, Dorothy says mild body on number one. What else y'all got? There's a debate here. Don thinks number two is more body than number one. I'm guessing you think the opposite, Taryn. Boulder bodied or fuller bodied on number two. Okay, so we do have some debate. So far, everything has been contentious 50-50. Some mom, some dad. Still thinking. Still thinking. I'll everything. say one is fuller body. Mm -hmm. All right. <clears throat> and I think we've got a fight over here too. My initial taste was uh, two was fuller body. Okay. That's my initial. So we've got a uh, contention over here as well. So some dad says number one is fuller bodied. Some mom says number two is fuller bodied. Um. Yeah. All right. Y'all are are at home on Saturday night, drink the wine. If like, if you want to be real professional about it, you can spit the wine. But the only point of spitting the wine is basically to remove the effects of inebriation because the more you get inebriated, the more dull your senses become. And so that's why professionals spit wine just because we don't want to dull our senses. Also, no one likes a drunk teacher. Um, I've had one once. It's terrible. So that's why I spit the wine, but you are more than welcome to just drink the wine. Um, it's totally up to you. Um, um, all right. So, oh, man, interesting. Um... I couldn't tell in the first glass I'll pour another. I like this. Yes. Um, there is definitely, this is why, you know, I, I'm often refilling glasses and blind tastings. There's so many different tests. You keep tasting the wine multiple times. You definitely get to know the wines every while. Um, so I'm going to have to agree with some mom here that number two has fuller body. Um, I think the textural component of number one with all that minerality, it feels like I just licked a sidewalk after it rained in the hot summer. Um, and yes, I have actually done that. That is what makes you a wine professional when you do those weird things. Um, so I think that the intense texture of minerality on wine number one can fool you to think it's, it's fuller bodied. Um, but just around the sides of my tongue, almost in the, like horseshoe shape, wine number two sits heavy on my entire tongue, like the entire palate kind of feels more coated um, with the wine. Yep. But again, the, we're splitting hairs here. They're both pretty darn similar and I do this on purpose. If I do two wines that are crazy different, it's too easy. And um, I have faith in y'all. So that's why I do some things that are a little bit harder. And so if you, if you had a different opinion than I just said, don't dismay, like, you had a different reaction to the wine, and that's perfectly okay. Um, we all have unique palettes for sure. Um, and they're similar enough that this is not, like, that's not a huge, like, make or break it kind of thing. So well, let's get into the last couple things, and then we're going to talk conclusion. So, um, all right. How does sweetness factor into body? Interesting. So sugar could make things feel thicker or fuller even though there's not a lot there. Interesting. So, um, <laughs> yes, Brian, d the dark arts of, uh, of the sommeliers is looking sidewalks and smelling everything. So I'm terrible to go on walks with for sure. Cause I just stop and smell everything. Um, but great question. So body can be affected by sugar. It can be affected by alcohol. It can be affected by acid, by tannins. All of these things are kind of different components that affect the way you experience the body, the weight of the wine in your mouth, but it's a thing in and of itself. So you can have a sweet wine that's light bodied. You can have a sweet wine that's fuller bodied. Um, so the sugar content, while it goes up and down, doesn't necessarily automatically change the body level. Most people were taught that 
higher alcohol means fuller bodied. And that's not the case. It kind of changes irrespective to sugar, acid, alcohol, tannin, mineral, all of these other things. So it just takes some practice to literally train your brain to only think about the weight of the wine on you, um, like sidewalks and do weird things. So um, I would disagree, but that's a fight for Father's Day, not Mother's Day weekend. Um, all right, so let's talk about balance and complexity. So these things kind of go hand in hand, but again, are their own thing. So balance, think of a, a, a teeter-totter. So all of these flavors exist, all of these textural components, structural components, flavors, aromatic smell, everything exists on a teeter-totter. Well, if one thing is really going to dominate, it kind of pushes the teeter-totter to one side versus another thing really dominate. Is it, is it um, all over the place or is it balanced? Like it kind of has the same amount. So if you did a dropper, an eyedropper of all of these different flavors and structural components, is it the exact same ratio for all things? Is it really balanced? Is it cohesive? Does it feel integrated? Is it braided all together into one unit? Or does it feel like there's this burst of things that are disjointed and all over the place? Um, complexity is similar, but slightly different. So it's just how many of those flavors are there? So on that, on that teeter-totter, are there basically like three flavors? Like the first one, we've got lemon, melon, maybe some white flowers, and all of the chalky minerality. Um, so that would be a little bit more on the simple side, even though it might be balanced versus another wine might have so many different flavors, just really, really complex, but maybe it's off balance. So you can have a wine that is very complex, that is also balanced. You can have a wine that's very complex, that's off balance. You can have a balanced wine that's simple. You can have a balanced wine that's complex. They are not mutually exclusive. Um, they can go together. They don't have to. So separate but similar things. If that makes any sense, hopefully I haven't just um, muddied the waters even more. Um, um, <laughs> you're having a guessing debate over here. Awesome. I love it. Well, don't get into conclusions yet. The key to blind tasting is not to jump to conclusions too fast. So if you do, you just struggle with all the confirmation bias. Um, so which one would you say had more of a balance? Which one do you think is more cohesive, where you where you taste one wine instead of just disjointed flavors? Um, what do you think? Right here. So Marion says number two has better balance. Luke says number one. I love these debates. They're awesome. A lot of balance and complexity, that's a little bit more um, um, subjective versus objective. I think it um, really depends on what you got out of the wine, your personal experience. So everything else, in terms of acid and alcohol, there's, there's right and wrong answers to that, actually. Um, when it comes to balance and complexity, it's a lot more your personal interpretation of the wine, your experience. So Steve Hill, Sam Dad says, number one was more balanced. Sorry, Taryn. Well, Taryn's tasting different wines. So um, that um, number two says, that actually makes sense, Taryn, because I know the tasting. So um, number two, balance like Gabby Douglas. <laughs> okay, I like that. Um, both change as they warm up. Yeah, wines totally continue to change and develop and morph. That's the fun of it. It's like having a conversation with someone that you just met. If after 20 minutes, You've talked about the exact same thing for 20 minutes, and every time you see them from then on after your neighbor on the street walking the dog or whatever, you always talk about the exact same thing for 20 minutes. That kind of gets old real fast. The interesting conversations are the one that go from politics to religion to weather to health, like to, to everything, childhood, trauma, or whatever it is. Um, the interesting conversations continue to morph and develop, and that's how wine should be. Best wines continue to morph and develop as they um, as they um, as they get older, um, as they get open. Sorry. Um, all right, number one, we've got uh, for balance. We've got we've got um, contention there. Complexity. I would say number one has more balance but less complexity. So it's a balanced, simple wine. Number two. 
I would say also on the simpler side, but maybe a little bit less balanced, but again, we're splitting hairs. There's pretty minute differences between these. So, um, okay. Um, number one remains tart. Yes, the acid remains very pronounced on the first one. Um, in terms of the fruit, like I'm getting all acidic fruit, even though we thought that wine number two had higher acid structure to it when we focused on that, the fruit is more acidic on wine number one versus more baked and soft and round and rich on wine number two. So, all right, we have got our notes now. Now is when we can turn to the cheat sheet, which hopefully has been hidden away. So this is a sheet of any possible white grapes that I would test you on. Um, obviously there's thousands and thousands of grape varieties, so please do not think that this is a comprehensive list. These are some, oh, look, I, I picked 10 classic grape varieties and I, I'll switch pages up here and there just to offer different selections. I'm not offering always the same ones, um, but this is what we've got. So I've broken down some very classic descriptors of these grape varieties. The thing is, if wine always fit into an exact box, if every Chardonnay tasted like, um, if every old world Chardonnay tasted like yellow and green apples, pear and lemon, it had higher acid and lower alcohol content, it was dry, dry and medium to medium body. And if it was that simple, no one would need to be teaching YouTube classes on blind tasting. So um, please know that this is a generality um, and that's what makes blind tasting fun. So take some time, look through this and what we're trying to do, not trying to figure out if this wine reminds us of a Chardonnay we had before. Please like erase your memory of every wine you have had before that will hurt you in terms of making a uh, reference point. What you do is you take your notes on these wines and figure out which one it closest matches to. Like those SAT questions that are so frustrating, what's the best answer? There are multiple possible answers that could be correct, but what's the best possible answer? So go ahead and just make your conclusions for wine number one and wine number two. And again, give yourself um, the ability to just automatically X out anything. So let's start from the bottom. Um, Gewürztraminer, that's how that's pronounced, Gewürztraminer, the W is a V. We're gonna, we're gonna X that out for both of these wines. Um, and here's why. Floral, honeysuckle, honey, beeswax, orange, spice, lychee, and peach. Not a single one of those things was mentioned on either of these wines. So process of elimination really helps with blind tasting. We're gonna ixnay the Gewürztraminer. Um, let's see what else we can possibly rule out without me giving anything away. Well, let's go ahead and um, ixnay on the uh, VNEA. So floral, white, orange, tangerine. We got some of that on wine number one, but it says low to medium acid, and that wasn't either of these wines. Also says low to medium alcohol. That was it. Dry to off dry, medium to full body. The only wine that, that could have fit with the floral, white, orange, tangerine, apple, lemon thing, but it's not weighty, was wine number one, and it's definitely lighter bodied for sure. So we're going to ixnay the Virtuaminer and Viognier. Riesling, remember that Riesling is um, always dry unless it's not, meaning that the um, dry Riesling is more common to find on the global market than sweet Riesling. So don't think because neither of these wines had sweetness that they're not Riesling. Let the actual descriptors match to you. Go through, this is when I'm going to be quiet now and let you... Um, let you just taste through these wines and uh, or go through your notes on these wines and come up with conclu conclusions. Go ahead and on the bottom, write possibly your two top choices for each of these. And remember, last blind tasting class, I did do two of the same exact grapes side by side just to fool everybody. So don't start psychoanalyzing me what would you see in any of those like psychological tricks. Um, so literally just let your notes tell you what the grape is. Write down your top two and then circle whatever one you actually. Uh, for those who didn't hear, the question from some mom was, 
On none of the descriptors do I have minerality listed, like that, that smell and taste of chalk or sidewalks or gravel or clay or anything, because that has nothing to do with the grape itself. It has everything to do with the location that the wine was grown in. Um, and so that gets into more advanced blind testing, uh, blind tasting technique where you're trying to name not just the grape, huge, huge, huge role. Um, for us and the purposes of tonight's class, we're just trying to name a grape. So minerality doesn't necessarily tell us that much um, because the grape can be grown in multiple different places. So, all right. Yes, yes, you can guess now. Type your answers in. Just make sure you type your answers in like number one or, or number two. Um, so Taryn from Colorado, tasting different wines. Remember, um, number one might be Chenin Blanc. Number two might be Riesling. Michelle says number two, Albarino because of the white tucks. I assume you mean socks actually, because I got a lot of white socks on number two. Just kidding. White rocks. Um, um, uh, which is a better indicator of what wine is flavor, smell, or character profile. Interesting. It's the combination of them all. You cannot blind taste exclusively from structure of the wine or from smell of the wine or from flavor of the wine. You have to have them all together. Um, it's like saying, which is more important to water, the hydrogen or the oxygen? Like you cannot have one without the other. Um, that was for you, mom, um, chemistry uh, professor over here. Um, all right, so let's see here. Um, too big to be a Riesling. Interesting, Vince. Um, Riesling's, Rieslings are more various in style than we give them credit for. We don't drink a whole lot of Riesling here in the States. And here's why is because we think Rieslings are sweet. And once you graduate past sweet white wines into red wines and dry wines, you never go back to Riesling until you realize that's where the real stuff is. Um, Riesling is like one of my favorite grapes for sure. Um, and uh, in a multitude of different styles. Um, but, um, definitely there's tons of different styles of Riesling. So I'm not saying that this is a Riesling. I'm just saying that th there are some Rieslings that could fit this category for sure. So we think Chardonnay maybe, um, um, let's see some Chenin Blanc or Pinot Gris. Number one, interesting. Number one, Steve, Papa says, uh, Steve says Albarino. It's just really weird to call my dad Steve, but that's how. <laughs> and number two might be Chardonnay. Number one, Chenin Blanc, two Albarino. Um, two a blank. Okay, so we're not really sure on two. Interesting. Okay, all right. Got some all over the place. Shardy, very shardy. Interesting. Okay. Um, shots fired. I love this. Everyone's getting real intense about this. This is so exciting. In in live classes that I've done this on, like literally sometimes like people will start like actually getting into fights with each other, usually significant others when they disagree and they're like, no, it's this, it's this. And it's, it's, it's fun to watch for sure. Um, <laughs> okay. So, um, Taryn says, what grape is Albarino? Albarino is the grape. Just like Riesling is a grape, Chardonnay is a grape, Albarino is the grape. Number one, we're guessing Gewürztraminer, 100% sure. Interesting, Brian, because that was the first wine we rolled out. I, I'm not sure if you're being uh, uh, facetious there, but um, uh, Michelle, great minds. Okay, awesome. So, um, all right, Vince, Finger Lakes region. Yes, um, the, uh, the doormat of the wine industry. Um, there's some amazing wines from Finger Lakes for sure. Um, but, um, I, I have, I, we don't have tons of them down here for sure. All right. So you might've updated your grape cheat sheet. Okay. Uh, oh wait, I haven't. They said they might not have updated theirs. Oh, gotcha. So whatever, whatever you've got in front of you, if you didn't print out from what I emailed you, Taryn, and that is like my my most up to date. I keep updating it all the time as, as I taste new wines and try new things. So, um, all right. So let's reveal wine. Number one, drum roll, please. Ah. Let me drop
running for a while. I was definitely an overachiever with these bags here. <laughs> All right. All right. So, wine number one is, in fact, an Alberino. Oh, Ferrero. Um, um, we are in the Rias Baixas area. Spain, so right above Portugal into Spain. Um, so Sam Dad got it right. Woohoo! Awesome. Um, and here is what. All right, I'll just leave that off. <laughs> my my OCD brain really wants to fix that right now, but I can't. Um, here is what would make this wine to me wine number one cling Albarino in my head. So Albarino, I listed on here the, the classic descriptors. Lemon pith, lemon zest, lemon seeds. We talked about all of the citrus for sure. White rocks. So yes, that is the one thing that has um, minerality listed. Yellow melon. We talked about melon for this one. Not specifically yellow, but we did talk about melon a couple of times. Sometimes banana and... This is just my personal preference, so I specifically looked for an Albarino without that banana um, guava tropical like banana cream pie kind of thing. Lighter to medium body. We got that on this one. It is dry, definitely. Medium to medium plus acid. We definitely got that on this. Um, um, and medium alcohol. So that actually matches all of the things that we discussed about this wine. So this is where it comes to listening to your own tasting notes. If you just try and like do your tasting notes and then make a guess based on your memory of what the last Albarino or Chardonnay that you tried was. Blind tasting, you're going to fail every time. You have to let the notes talk to you. It is about turning off the confirmation bias, turning off what you think you should be getting or what you think this should be, and literally just listening to your notes. So, um, Michelle, yes, you got it right too. So, awesome. Albarino. Um, not a big white wine drinker. I'll accept a feat as I, I love this. Yes. Um, Albarino is one of my favorite white grapes. I also just love the area of Galicia, Spain or Galicia, as they would say in uh, this area. Truly delicious. Um, let's talk about wine number two. So, um, so, man, I, I used cheaper bags last time. And I regretted that, but now I'm regretting using the really thick bags that are breaking my fingers. Um, wine number two, drum roll, please. It is a Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris from Oregon. Um, and let's talk about Pinot Gris for just a second. So this is from Brandborg um, Winery. So I actually feature their Gewürztraminer in my uh, wine packs right now, if you're interested. Um, love everything they do. Husband and wife team, they've been around for about 30 years, just south of Willamette Valley in Oregon. Um, and super small, organic production, delicious stuff. And focuses on white wine, some Pinot Noir as well. So let's talk about Pinot Gris. Pinot Gris is the same grape as Pinot Grigio. They're just made in different styles. So Pinot Grigio is the Italian interpretation of Pinot Gris. It originated in France, was brought to Italy, and the Italian pronunciation of the grape turned into Pinot Grigio, you know, just like that, um, with the hands and everything. Um, and that was made in a more like crisp, refreshing, higher acid green apple style versus Pinot Gris from its birthplace in Alsace, France, right on the border of France and Germany. Um, that was made in a more weighty style, a little bit more floral, more baked qualities, um, and a little more that honeysuckle beeswax component to it. Often Pinot Gris has a darker hue, which we definitely got that darker color. This was... This was not as dark as some Pinot Gris can be. Some Pinot Gris can look almost like a rosé. They're so dark. Um, so they are richer, aromatic, um, lower acid. Um, we actually got higher acid on this, so super interesting. Um, so not all wines, again, fit into every single corner of these boxes. Otherwise, we wouldn't need to teach classes. So dry to off dry. Um, got that medium to high acid, medium <laughs> ABS. <laughs> This is, this is what happens when you make these um, tasting sheets while drinking wine. I meant ABV, I think. Uh, <laughs> um, so 
That so the the waviness of it would lead me to believe that, but I think Chenin Blanc would be a great call on this. I think Chardonnay could also be a good call on this, um, an old world style. So if you guess Chardonnay or Chenin Blanc on this wine, like if I were grading you, like you'd still get like really awesome scores because both of those wines fit similarly into the, the style that this wine was. Not that all Pinot Gris is, but that this wine was. So again, you don't necessarily get the answer right if you guess the right grape, because if all your tasting notes are wrong, that's what they care about. So um, yeah, all right, so how are y'all feeling? Round one. Um, Taryn wants to know this first, is it really an Al Albarino Yes, Taryn, yours really is, a, is an Albarino, the Portello de Vento um, um, by Laura Lorenzo, one of my favorite producers in that area of Licia, Spain. She's like this badass chick with like dreadlocks down to her waist and just like bringing back all these natural winemaking techniques in that area. Um, but should it, it should be 100% Albarino, but um, I'll let you know. But she makes her wines in a pretty funky style. All right, so I promise the reds are going to go faster because now we've broken down all the tests. So whenever you're ready, let's go to the second round. You're going to pour out or drink the last bits of your white wine. Red wine number one, white wine number two. No need to rinse out your glass. If you do have glasses, don't rinse them out with water because that's going to change the pH balance of your glass. So, wine number one, Saturday. On the left, wine number two, on the right. As soon as you get them poured and shake off, like everyone literally, I know I can't see you, it's not Zoom, but just like shake off that last round. Um, don't let it affect your ability to go into the, the next round um, so that round round right um, so I'm gonna get this round right too like don't think about success and achievement uh, we're, we're so trained in 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 the United States and especially on the East Coast to think about where did I where did I fit on the success scale don't think about that we're here to have fun if you're having fun you're succeeding um, so shake off that last round. We're going into red wines, a totally different characteristic, um, totally different wines. And um, sometimes I'll do a wine blind tasting and I'll get like all of them right until the very last one when I'm so confident, I'm like, yeah, yeah, I got this. And then I fail so miserably, it just brings me to my knees in humility. So um, it's, it's, every wine is different and every, every blind tasting is different. So Let's go ahead and just check the um, site first. Let's go ahead and get the clarity. Both of the wines reflecting the light brilliantly. Woo! <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yep. There's always, that's why I wear black <laughs> to, the, to the tastings. Last time, the, the first class, I think, was anyone there when I, um, when I demonstrated that I had a spit cup and I accidentally sloshed it into my face? Yeah. Um, all right. So wine is reflecting brilliantly. Oh, sorry. I jumped into smelling. I shouldn't have. I'm sorry. Let's check out color. Oh, totally different, right? Oh, my gosh. So... Let's talk about, first of all, the most apparent distinction between these two wines is the concentration, not the color. It's almost like they're the exact same color. It's just that wine number two is way more concentrated and wine number one is a little bit more diluted, transparent. Um, almost the same exact hue, that, that borderline purplish hue of a wine. Um, I love that. I love that the main difference is not color, but concentration. So notice that I have, I have, if you can't tell, I have two fluorescent lights shining on me because um, last time it was so dark. Um, and even with those fluorescent lights, I cannot see through wine number two um, when I'm holding it down on its side, but I can see through wine number one. Hopefully everyone has the same experience. If not, um, make sure that wine number two, 
the red wine number two was the screw cap wine that you poured in your glass. Um, so wine number one, more transparent. Wine number two, more opaque. Let's look at those legs. <laughs> Vince, what love language are you talking right now? Um, <laughs> I'm speaking your love language right now. What, is it just wine in general? Um, sorry. Oh, man. I keep smelling too fast because I'm so excited about these wines. Let's look at those legs. Oh, yeah. We got some serious difference in legs here. Um, everyone notice that there's a very clear distinction for me between the, the, the legs of wine number one and wine number two. Um, number one, thinner, still pretty slow to form in fall, but definitely thinner and falling faster than wine number two, which is pretty slow to form, slow to fall and much thicker. By the way, let's confirm our suspicions that the white wines were different in alcohol percentage. Huh. So we were correct. Wine number one for the white wines was 13% alcohol. So like right around that medium-ish. And then the second white was around 14%. So about a whole percent um, higher than um, the last. So that is it's nice to have that confirmation. Sometimes I, I do these things and it's the opposite of what I just said it was. And um, All right. So let's see here. Um, the... All right, clarify here. Oh, okay. Red wine. Gotcha. That's your love language. Yes. Yes. I think wine in general is my love language, but that's just me. Um, first one smells like, all right, translate that for me. I'm sorry. I'm asking you to clarify so many things. Um, what does sun to mean? Um, um, <laughs> all right. Brian says, the last time I poured red wine, out of a small brown bag, it was Mad Dog. Yes, I'm so grateful. We are. I promise you, we are not tasting Mad Dog. If anyone had guessed that that was the case, Scott is in there. Use that wine aroma grid. Let's talk about intensity between the two. Let's talk about fruit. Remember to name fruit conditions. So whatever you're thinking, if one is cherry, if one is licorice, if one is whatever, talk to me about the condition of the fruit, and then non-fruit too. Manure, love that. Oh, sanitary tank. Okay, yes, yeah. That uh, that a little bit of. I mean, it's, it's a little, it smells a little shitty, right? It smells um, smells like some manure. Some some. Yep, it smells like horseshit. A uh, little bit, just a little bit. Not like ob obscenely so. I've I've definitely had those, but a little bit so. Y'all are laughing, but it's true. <laughs> Man, man, I got excited about the white wines, but definitely get excited about, about um, the smell of these red wines. They're drastically different. For me, the first impression, both of the wines have about the same amount of intensity, except one just has so much more of the non-fruit characteristics, you know, some of that manure just the earthiness in general, leather, spice, herbs, smoky, all of, all of that stuff. Um, and number two has so much more of like the fruit in my face. So to me, the intensity is the same. They're just speaking different languages. It's, it's like, it's like <laughs> when I, I lived in Peru for a while and, um, and I would see these expats, these people lived there that were from other countries, just yelling at the Peruvians in English and the Peruvians yelling back at them in Spanish, each thinking that speaking louder in a different language was gonna help communication. That's kind of how these slides are doing right now. They're both kind of yelling at me, but they're both speaking different languages, um, if that makes any sense at all. Ah, number two makes you wanna sneeze too. Yes, that black pepper note. Love it, love it, love it. Some of that funky going on. Yep, yep. Um, I really want to write, uh, rewrite the song, play that funky music, white boy. I want to rewrite it to <laughs> pour that funky wine song, girl. Um, <laughs> and I want to do the music video. <laughs> it's it's on my bucket list. Just saying. And I'd be and I'd be drinking a wine kind of like this. Yeah. 
<laughs> I promise I'm spitting the wine, y'all. Uh. All right, talk to you about what else you're smelling here. Number one smells like whiskey. Okay, so we got some of that like oaky component to it, maybe that vanilla-ish component. So we got white pepper, also a number one, versus a black pepper and wine number two. Um, overripe cherry. So thank you for naming the condition. Awesome, Taryn. Overripe cherries on number two. two. Um, yes, yes, yes. All the all the fruit is definitely on number two. If someone said anything fruit related on wine number one first. And that was the first thing you smelled, I'd be surprised. Um, there is fruit there for sure, 100%. It's just not the first thing that's apparent uh, in the wine. Um, when someone used the same shower for 20 years, oh, <laughs> I have a terrible image in my mind now. Oh, I, I, Vince, I don't know if you're invited back to this show with those comments. I'm just kidding, you're invited back. Um, um, number one, all I get is green bell pepper. Okay. Awesome. Um, number two, um, pink and black pepper. Hello, my friend. Okay. Um, yeah, we definitely, that's why we said we were going to sneeze on number two, that black pepper. I agree with the green pepper on number one. Um, again, not fruit, but vegetal components on wine number one, um, smoky, um, other earthy components. Number two, overripe. Great. Yes, 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 yes. <clears throat> smells like the aftermath of the first Saturday in May. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, specifically in COVID situation, May, or is this just like every first Saturday in May smells like this, Brian? I'm, 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 I'm intrigued now. Um, all right. Number one, definitely have some funky going on. All right, some wet, wet horse on wine number one. Yes, yeah, so again, that Britannomyces, that's a fungus that grows in cellars that affects the smell of certain wines, um, can smell like horse manure. It can smell like um, 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 uh, saddle leather. It can smell like a wet horse kind of thing, any of those. So jam on number one, interesting, okay. Um, horse barn for sure. All right, great. Um, let's talk and wet tobacco. Love that call. Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Let's get into tasting y'all. We're going to, um, do this a little bit faster than we did the white wines. Um, also, I don't know why, but my battery went from a hundred percent to 5% in just the last two hours. So, um, if this cuts out, so we might have to speed this up a little bit more because I wasn't expecting, uh, I didn't have my charger with me because <laughs> normally 100% lasts me for two days. So um, anyways, uh, we might we might um, get cut off and that would be terrible for a blind tasting. But let's go ahead and uh, um, taste through the wine. Let's go through the test. Tannins is the one test that we do for red wines. We don't do for white wines. And that's the mouth drying sensation in the front of of your mouth so you can stick the wine in your mouth into your gums like so let it hang out there for a little bit um and then you analyze how dry your mouth feels afterwards it takes a while to resaturate your mouth with moisture after you do this so um be careful as you do that so it's probably a different tartar it's okay. um, no, they're not all the same. Sorry, we're having charger debates now. All right, so first impressions, taste, and then do the swish and swirl taste. So, um, Wow, you cannot get more different than this. This is like, it's like those sisters that you meet, but it's hard to believe they're related kind of thing. Um, I've got six siblings, so that happens all the time. Um, half of us look identical, the other half of them look identical, and um, but nobody believes that we're all related until you all see us hang out. Um, but, but these wines, taste dramatically different. Um, there's almost nothing similar about them. Oh. 
holy chalk mouth. Yes. So first wine's holy acid. Second, holy chalk mouth. Ooh. Man, wines are radically, radically different. All right, let's go through, let's go through the profile. Acid, which wine, which wines of these had a higher acid component to them? Um, um, they taste better than they smell. Yes, Britannomyces, that fungus that creates that uh, thing. Again, it's not added to the wine. It's not in your wine. It's just a smell that affects the wine, just like when you leave milk unopened in the refrigerator and you cut an onion and leave it unopened in the refrigerator. After 24 hours, your milk will smell like raw onions. Um, so it's the same kind of thing. This fungus kind of just grows in these rafters um, and then um, it affects the smell of the wine, but it doesn't affect the taste. So number one, we say has higher acid, okay. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely would agree. Oh, <laughs> you know, it's funny. My dad and I often disagree about our tasting notes, but he often gets the grape right. Like he guesses the right grape. It's really interesting. So even though we have opposite tasting notes. Guess is the proper word. <laughs> So to me, a very I get pretty darn low acid on the second wine. First wine was definitely some acid and minerality for sure, but um, the second wine, yes, let's talk about the tannins in the second wine. If you push both of the wines up into your mouth, first wine is like, it's there. You feel it for sure, especially since it's the first time. But that second wine just punches your gums like it just takes their fingernails and like rakes the fingernails down the gums. Very different experience. So number one, moderate tannins. Number two, high tannins. Tannins are an astringent. It's a long chain polymer that absorbs moisture from what's around it, suspended into the wine when it's young, sinks to the bottom of the wine, becomes sediment as it as the wine ages. Um, but yes, uh, they can be different textures as well. So some tannins can be like super fine where it feels like just these tiny little scrapes on your um, on your palate versus really aggressive tannins. And that all depends on how the wine was made and what grape it is. So Whew. I mean, number one, I get some tannins. But number two. Oh man. It's hard. <laughs> hard to talk. Hard to talk. Um the tannins literally just my 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 lips are just stuck in the front of my mouth right now. They can't figure out how to move again. Um, so number two, crazy high tannins. Acid, so we are going a little bit lower on the first one. Um, and generally red wines are lower acid than white wines. So the acid scale from one to five is one to five white wine and one to five red wine, which is always a couple steps lower. Um, so I'd say for number one, we're talking, um, like a three, three and a half acid level. Number two, maybe like a three. So like just slightly higher on number one. Sweetness, did anyone do the sweetness test on these? Who ain't no sweetness in number one. She ain't sweet at all. I think it's a he. Number two, 
Ain't no sweetness either. Um, yes, these, neither of these wines are sweet at all. Zero residual sugar. Tannins, much higher. So we're talking like a four and a half um, for number five. Uh, um, sorry, four and a half for number two. Maybe like a three and a half for number um, number one there. Alcohol, how far down do you feel that burn? I need some more wine for this. Here. <laughs> so you you got a shout out, Papa. Um, um, Tawana says, thank you. She agrees with you often. She always feels like she's wrong, but she agrees with you. <laughs> so again, everybody has different chemical reactions in your mouth and how you experience the wine. So don't dismay at all. So, um, <laughs> all right. Um, Tawana asks, um, do the higher tannins affect the way you react to acid? Well, it's just distracting more than anything. It's hard to think about your mouth watering in the back of your mouth when you're thinking about the mouth drying out in the front of your mouth. So it's more distracting, but plenty of wines are high acid and high tannin. So, um, or sometimes they're low acid, low tannin. So again, it's kind of like that alcohol and body sweetness and body thing. They don't correlate necessarily. It's just training your brain to focus on one versus the other. The acidity test. So after you swish and swirl, swallow the wine and lean back. Touch the tip of your tongue to the roof of your mouth behind your front teeth and breathe in. And focus on how much you're puckering back here and how much your mouth is watering. That's the acid test right there. So... <laughs> Um, all right, so we've talked about acid, sweetness, tannin. Let's talk about alcohol. Which one of these feel like they are higher alcohol content? Oh, I'm down to 2% battery. You might need to speed this up. I'm so sorry, y'all. I, I don't know what's wrong with my computer. It was literally 100% just when I started this um, video. I've never seen it go down that fast. I think it means I need an update or something. I'm so sorry. All right, so... Um, Alcohol, number one, I get a lot more moderate. Okay, great. Um, moderate alcohol, number one. Number two, fuels that heat, man. I feel that heat all the way down. Um, this wine has some higher alcohol content, number two, for sure. Um, in terms of body, body, I guess for this, portion of the tasting, the body is going to be um, similar to the alcohol percentage. It doesn't always rule out that way, but we all, I think we're getting like way more fuller bodied textural components to wine number two than wine number one. Um, all right, so I'm gonna rush this through just because I don't want it to cut out right in the middle. Let's go ahead and go through our our, oh man, I'm so frustrated. Our, um, our classic descriptors. Um, I'm gonna nail out. We're gonna rule out all thin skin grape varieties because neither of these wines we could um, read through easily. Number one is a thin skin grape, I mean a medium skin grape variety because we could read through it not as easily. Number two is a thick skin grape variety. So we are going to go ahead and make your conclusions. Make them fast because there is literally a timeline now. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, y'all. I, so I tell us, give us the answer. Yes, okay. Why number one? Go ahead, write it down really fast, y'all. While I rip these bags open. <laughs> I mean, I guess if the video cuts out, you can open the bags and see for yourself. Um, Marion says, why number one, Cap Front? Why number two, Syrah? Who else is making guesses? Why number one, Cab Franc? Why number two, Cab Sauv? Interesting. Anyone else? No Zin? I don't think I am. Um... So why number one is a medium skin variety. You tell me if wine number one tasted like a Zin. Kate and I have decided that wine number one is Gamay or Pinot Noir. No, it's not because we're going to rule out thin skin varieties. That's what we just said. We're going to rule them out because well, we number could not Malbec. read through them. Salmon says number one Malbec. Anyone want to agree with her? Oh, my word. So much craziness tonight. 
All right, wine number one. Who ruled Cabernet Franc? Wine number oh. one. Wine number one, we did have some green pepper, although it wasn't as pronounced on this as we thought it would be. Um, from the Loire Valley of France. So that's what that earthiness, that Bortanomyces, a little bit of that funk was. Um, gorgeous wine, amazing with steak and food for sure. Old porch wine. Wine number two. Ah! Cabernet Sauvignon from Australia. Thus right. that like men related green pop for sure. Um, and so this is Wits End. It's a second label by Chalk Hill from uh, California. They have a property in Australia. Um, and this is a Cabernet Sauvignon. So Cabernet Sauvignon, just so you know, is the, the child of Cabernet Franc, red wine number one, and Sauvignon Blanc. They, um, they got together had a couple glasses of wine and made Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, so that is the genetic child of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. Interesting that a lighter bodied red wine and a white wine can make this full bodied, crazy tannic red wine, but that's how genetics work. Um, if this, if I run out, I'm at 0% battery. So I'm just gonna, I can be impatient with me. I promise this won't happen again. I'll have like backup chargers and backup, backup chargers in the future. Um, this has been amazing. Thank you guys so